I will go ahead and uh, start this. As Isaac said, it's it's a it's a longer video. Um, tried to pack a bunch of stuff in. Uh, it, if it means anything, it was much longer to even kind of cut down to this to show you uh, developers and, and participants of the boot camp um, what we've been building and uh, most importantly what's possible to build uh, on the IC and that. Everything that you see that is on the IC was built uh, in Matoko. So happy Matoko Bootcamp. And here we go. Greetings. Welcome. And thanks for joining for this brief overview of IC Pipeline. Uh, we are Matthew Beekman and Dan Ryan, principal partners in IC Pipeline. As it happens, Matthew and I are on opposite coasts at the moment, in the U.S., in California, and New York, respectively. Off the top, we'd like to extend our warm thanks to Cedric, Seb, Isaac, Artia, and everyone at Code and State uh, for welcoming our participation in Motoko Boot Camp 2023. Uh, by organizing and executing this event uh, quite brilliantly, if we do say so, uh, they have made a great big gift to this whole community. So again, guys, sincere thanks for that. Like Code and State and a handful of other key players in the community, uh, we feel like we are part of a community within the community that is focused on improving the IC developer experience. Uh, that list of players, uh, even just the ones we've had the pleasure of starting to get to know, reads more and more like a full stack in terms of how the different teams are solving gaps that are complementary and mutually beneficial to one another. Uh, data solutions, identity and wallet solutions, version control, analytics, ever-expanding language support, emerging token standards, and so on. Uh, it is pretty cool. We actually contributed the MBT faucet DAP uh, for Motoko Bootcamp. So it's something that most of you have probably seen and touched. Uh, since we used IC Pipeline to build that faucet project, it should make a good use case for the demo that we'll do here in just a moment. There's quite a bit more to the framework, but now I think is a great time for me to stop talking and we'll hand this over to Matthew. Hello, my name is Matthew Beekman and with no further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we are looking at the front end of a Internet Computer D app, and we're going to get logged in with Internet Identity, uh, which is pretty straightforward. The first thing we're going to do is turn uh, my laptop into a local host replicator. And we're going to give it a name, uh, Matt's, oops, Matt's laptop. And uh, as you can see here, there's a few choices. Uh, we've made it very easy to include Internet Identity and the ICP ledger or the, the um, Internet Computer's uh, token uh, ledger into the local development environment so you can uh, write code and, and interact with it as if it was uh, a mainnet uh, deployment. And we've also got uh, some neat things happening with Motoko Playground, which will allow you to uh, expand the time limits, uh, as well as uh, sling Motoko Playground projects into uh, a local environment or a replicator environment, because we could do it on the shared environment as well. And by removing the uh, time limits, but also allowing you to then save those as projects, um, that could be the beginning of, of uh, some very interesting things. We've been working with Definity. We're very excited. Uh, when you're configuring a replicator, you can choose uh, some default settings for how DFX starts. Uh, and the checkbox uh, choices are, are self-explanatory. And as well, if for one reason or another, you have things that you'd like to do uh, special uh, when you start the replica you can actually write a shell script and um, it will then execute that instead of uh, the pre-built checkbox version uh, we're not going to do that we're going to uncheck that and we're just going to do the defaults matt's laptop so this will create a replicator profile uh, of you know local host uh, or a local replicator and we will be able to grab a one-time 
uh, use token that along with a shell script uh, will be able to turn my laptop into this replicator. So I'm gonna copy that and I'll paste this in that I copied from there. This includes, as I said, a one-time token and uh, it's curling a bash script uh, that we're hosting uh, similar to the way the install for the SDK uh, or DFX uh, CLI from Definity works. So uh, go ahead and run through that. What it does first is it checks to make sure you have things installed that we're going to need. Uh, DFX, uh, Node, and NPM. If you don't, it will point you in the right direction and uh, some of these things it will automatically install as part of this script making life uh, for a beginner even that much easier. I'm going to proceed with setup. Yes. And what's going to happen now is it's downloading uh, basically these local tools, mostly uh, Node, a uh, bunch of shell scripting as well. And this allows your workstation to communicate with the ICPM uh, on an ongoing basis whenever it's turned on. Uh, you have the ability to turn it on and off, uh, which I'll show you. And uh, it's very uh, useful, you'll see, as, as we go forward. Um, it's downloading the Internet Identity uh, and Ledger and Matoko Playground uh, code as well so that those can be deployed. And again, that's all scripted and, and made painless uh, by uh, doing this install. Uh, you now have a, a command line a tool set. Uh, we're going to quickly look at the help menu. and. You know, as you read through this, you can start to get a better understanding of, of what it can do, and I'll show uh, most of it here now. So, uh, as you can see, this currently has a status of inactive inside of our ICPM uh, for my laptop's uh, replicator, and I'm going to go ahead and turn this thing on. Uh, I see pipeline up. Oops, can't spell. I see pipeline up. And what this does is executes a, a binary that we just downloaded, and it starts a communication with uh, the Internet Computer D app that uh, basically orchestrates all this stuff. As you can see now, it thinks it's running because it's touching. We can actually uh, take a look at it. Uh, this is following the log of uh, the uplink service. and. As you stare at this more and more and more, you'll get used to kind of where it is in the process. But it, it, it's cyclical. It, it kicks off about every 20 seconds, and uh, it's polling the uh, Internet computer uh, DAP. A deployment package is made up of what are called project profiles. Uh, these are vocabulary words that uh, we've created to try to describe some of this, and I'll get a little more detail there uh, in a minute. But... Uh, to keep things moving, I'm going to go ahead and kick off a deployment now that we have something uh, of interest to deploy. And in the new deployment interface, uh, which I briefly showed, you, you have the ability to override any of the defaults that you set for the replicator. So, for instance, if you uh, did not want to include the Internet identity in this particular deployment, uh, you could, you know, Uninclude it, uh, but for the moment uh, we're going to use the defaults. The same thing goes with the DFX start. You can override whatever you might have, have set. Kick that off, and um, while that's going, uh, we'll talk about a few other pieces uh, or, or concepts. One is the idea of a job. So inside of ICPM, pretty much everything that interacts with a replicator is a job, and um, you can monitor the job. Uh, it's a little less interesting because it's just watching the singular, you know, uh, job, is it done or not. Or you can watch the deployment. A little more interesting because it actually is getting uh, notices as certain pieces of that deployment um, are accomplished or, or completed. And uh, additionally, you can go to the command line, uh, as we were doing before, and you can uh, follow uh, the the log that is the actual deployment. All these logging events uh, will be captured, will be sent back to ICPM, and will be uh, archived as uh, part of the deployment so that you can refer back to it, troubleshoot, uh, make comparisons, um, 
now that that's done, you can see we have an acids canister. We have a Matoko canister. These two canisters in blue, they make up the project that we added called Hello Pipeline 2. Uh, it also deployed these utility canisters. You can tell by the, the, the gray edging of uh, Internet Identity and ICP Ledger. And uh, down here, the, the log that was in essence being you know, shown while you're doing IC Pipeline Follow, as I said, was being captured and then is sent back uh, to ICPM as the uh, details of this specific deployment. Uh, these deployment steps are all tracked individually. Uh, you can launch this uh, replicator uh, deployment code. You can see the steps that are being executed and you can actually jump to parts of the log uh, that are specific to that particular step. Process, you know, where it actually went ahead and did a, a NPM install um, and then did a deployment using DFX deploy and here are all the details that uh, normally are just in the terminal and are relatively ephemeral and now that all that's launched you can actually with a click you can go see the front end of our IC pipeline hello too and as I mentioned this is uh, a D app that helps demonstrate the internet identity the internet identity canister was launched uh, as part of this deployment inside of the local uh, replica. Uh, you can see the front end here. Uh, you can actually click and see the, the Candid interface for the internet identity here uh, using the Candid UI that was also deployed on the local replica. And with this URL, you can paste that into our Hello Pipeline 2 demo and change um, the internet identity URL that this app will use, and now we'll basically authenticate off of the internet identity that we deployed. Um, at the beginning though, it doesn't have actually an anchor, right? So we're gonna create an anchor, and we've set all the, the you know, minimal requirements. So as far as the CAPTCHA, it's just this single letter A. Uh, this is just to really make your life easy. Uh, it, it's bypassing the need for the, the biometric authentication. Again, notice too that this is test only. If you really feel like you need to turn all that stuff on, uh, we can show you how to do that as well. And we've now got this internet identity of 1000. Um, and now that that's actually been authenticated, our app is letting us in, right? So just to kind of go all the way through the process, we've created an anchor that anchor is now in the internet identity that is inside of the local replica that is inside of our workstation or laptop in this case. So uh, now that that's been configured, now that we've created that anchor, I can use this app and over and over and over again, authenticate with an anchor of uh, 10,000 and it'll just work. And um, the neat thing is that all of this was done without having to really understand how to launch the internet identity this point is we've now created this anchor right and if this was just me I only really need the one anchor unless I have a special reason why I need to uh, do more and I could also you know pump in transactions into the ledger but I won't as part of this uh, demonstration but you, you could because both of the state uh, or the, excuse me the state from both of these canisters will be captured in the snapshot I'm about to take so we'll take a snapshot uh, we'll call this a uh, testing uh, first II, and uh, that will create a job. Like I said before, everything kind of works off jobs. We can view the job, watch the job. Uh, we can go to the deployment that's actually you know doing the snapshot. You can watch the job. Uh, you'll see that certain uh, buttons get deactivated you know while that's taking place because what the job's actually doing is it's stopping the replica and uh, taking a snapshot and then starting the replica back up and what you really should do is just let it do its thing and it'll let you know when it's complete so uh, it should only take a few minutes again you can go back to the uh, local host if you wish and uh, take a quick look at that uh, I've still got the follow-up and it's going through its process. As you can see, it just finished the, the uh, 
a snapshot and it's in the process of turning the replica uh, back on. It's got a healthy state. Um, it's now turning everything so that you can basically go back where you were and you'll see that this front end still is active uh, with your uh, 10,000 anchor. Now the thing that's interesting is that that's now been captured in a snapshot. If you go into uh, your replicators uh, replica console, replicator console and manage snapshots you can see that snapshot or on the left hand side uh, there's a snapshot link and you can see that, see that snapshot. Uh, from the replicator uh, console um, you can deploy that snapshot uh, directly or restore it or you can set it as your starter state uh, which is really neat so if I set it as my starter state it's going to include those two canisters in my next deployment All right, so we do a new deployment you're gonna say use starter state and that starter state will have those two canisters but it will also deploy my deployment package All right so we'll go ahead and deploy now and this deployment package, if you recall, has the Hello Pipeline 2, which is the internet identity uh, demonstration that we've created. And once that's actually complete, we will uh, be able to launch the Hello Pipeline 2 application and immediately log in with our anchor of 10,000. Again, this included the internet identity that we already created the anchor. And because of that, I've launched a new version of this project. And I can see by going here that my 10,000 anchor is still active. I can grab that URL. I can go to my application. Whoops. Uh, my application front end set that ii and immediately without having to create an anchor go through the whole rigmarole i'm able to start testing and playing with my app but uh, for the sake of this demo we should probably jump into uh, doing remote uh, replicators uh, these are the ones that would allow teams to share deployments and uh, minimize the requirements of the people playing with those deployments or, or uh, feature versions uh, without having to actually deploy anything locally. And uh, what we want to do is first create what's called a remote host replicator. Uh, so this is going to be our remote host one. Uh, as we mentioned before, this is being deployed uh, for you on uh, your behalf to a Web2 uh, cloud hosting facility. Uh, we use AWS. Uh, Google Cloud is in the future. Uh, or GCP and uh, Azure. Uh, we also have the ability for you to utilize your own AWS account. We have some uh, scripting that you can run in your AWS account and then you can use IC Pipeline to, to launch these same resources uh, securely inside of your own walled garden. Uh, happy to talk to you about what that uh, would entail uh, going forward. Uh, but just like the local host, there's defaults uh, that you can set for the replica or replicator uh, what utilities to launch uh, and how to start the uh, replica on that remote host uh, replicator. Now, since these are uh, launched into uh, cloud services, there is inherently a cost, as I mentioned earlier. And in order to cap those costs, you can set a, a timeout. So, uh, how long will this replicator run before it shuts itself off? This way you don't uh, leave them running for a very long time and, and incur a whole bunch of costs. Uh, a pip uh, is an approximation of about five cents and uh, we're, we're charging uh, to use our services on AWS. Uh, basically the, the five cents gets you 10 minutes. And um, we're gonna go ahead and set this one to six. Uh, by default, uh, every new user in the beginning is going to get uh, six pips. Basically, you can play with one of these things for an hour. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more after uh, the demonstration, but we'd like to see if we can get some folks to help us beta test and, and continue to beta test. And uh, you might get some, some free pips in the, in the process. Um, so a remote host, uh, we're going to go ahead and start it. And these things take about, you know, 
four minutes, give or take, to actually launch and uh, configure themselves before they're available. I'm going to kick this thing off. Uh, you can see uh, that it's running and um, it creates a couple jobs. As I told you before, everything runs off a job. Uh, we can take a quick look. There's a, a job called R start. R is for replicator. It's a way to visually distinguish um, from you know other jobs that might be you know taking place on a replicator versus controlling you know whether a replicator is on and off. And um, it'll start. It'll then do what's called add target, and then it'll basically uh, boot and you know launch an Ubuntu DFX workstation. All right, so our uh, remote replicator has uh, completed. It takes about four minutes, as I told you, and it's now up and running. And um, we're going to go ahead and create a deployment package. Now, the local replicator, we use the command line to create a deployment package. Here, we're going to actually configure the deployment package uh, via the, the UI interfaces. So create a new deployment package. Um, the local deployment package we can't use on a remote, uh, so we're going to have to create a new one. Um, but we don't have any uh, available project profiles, right? Only the local one uh, that was created uh, from the command line. So first thing we're actually going to do is create a uh, new profile, and uh, we're going to use a, a slightly different one uh, just so that I can uh, show you something else. We'll do a hello snapshot. Uh, and we'll call this uh, hello snap. Um, for the most part, all you have to really do is throw the GitHub in there uh, if there's anything special outside of the defaults of like an NPM install. And if there's any tokens for, for GitHub that you need in order to grab um, the, the replicator, uh, whatever branch or, or what have you, but if there's a token to get into this Git endpoint, uh, you can put it in there. And we'll save this. Uh, so now we have a project profile. Uh, we'll then go into the packages and uh, we'll create a new deployment package. Uh, this will be of type replica. Uh, we'll get into the on-chain deployments uh, here in a minute, but uh, first we're going to create our hello uh, snap uh, package. Oops. And uh, type and description are for your uh, use and um, eventually being able to create uh, package profiles. This will allow third parties to create packages uh, that will then be available to people uh, to deploy uh, in their local development environments, whether it be on their workstations or part of the, the replica, shared replica spaces. So identity management, uh, data-based uh, solutions, uh, et cetera. Um, third parties or, or you know, folks that are building tooling and, and services would be able to integrate uh, into IC Pipeline and make that available to you. Um, we're going to add a project profile, uh, this Hello Snap that we just created. And since this is a replicator, uh, we can define a branch. Uh, we're just going to use main. Uh, we, we can have feature branches and uh, as we get into to more videos that kind of work deeper into use cases. But uh, this should be good enough for now. Uh, it reiterates just so that you can see uh, what's going to, to be executed for this particular thing. And as I showed you on the uh, local replicator, you can choose uh, different web packs uh, for your, your different projects if you have multiple. Basically, this results down into either no uh, web pack service or it'll launch a 80, port 8080, port 8081, and port 8083. Um, I mean, 8082, uh, if you were uh, to utilize and have that many uh, different um, projects launched all as part of the same deployment package. So we'll just do the one just to, to, to show you what's going on. And uh, now that that deployment package is created, uh, we can go back to the replicator and uh, we can configure this uh, remote host replicator with that new deployment package. Uh, now that that remote replicator knows uh, what to deploy, uh, just like the local uh, host replicator, uh, there is a um, uh, ability to kick off a new deployment, uh, which we'll go ahead and do. Uh, again, similarly, you can um, override uh, the default uh, deployment, you know, as far as DFX start uh, 
parameters. And just like the local environment, uh, you can watch uh, that deployment take place. Now, uh, this is not running on your local machine. And so you might be asking, well, how would I monitor it with the similar uh, fashion that you were with the local workstation? Uh, we provide that through a web interface uh, for shell access. And this is going to open the door for me to show you something else that's really neat. So uh, I'll pause for a second just to take a deep breath. We are running a remote replicator. What that means is, is that it's not my local workstation. It's a workstation that's out on the Internet. And uh, obviously, we want that to be secure. We don't want our, our uh, projects. Uh, the whole point of this particular uh, use case is to be able to share our projects without them ever going to the main net. Uh, that means that we need a level of authentication uh, for that you know, remote host. And uh, we've done some pretty neat things uh, that I'll just show you here in a second, but just so you know what's going on. This is going to try to access the shell. Uh, the shell is actually a web service that's running on that remote replicator. And that web service is behind um, a CDN that won't let you in unless you have been authenticated. So we've built the ability to authenticate with Internet identity. And then that Internet identity authentication is passed to our CDN or, or content delivery network, which then creates a set of signed cookies um, that then grant access to what we're calling the replicator network in which your replicator uh, is hosted. So with all of that said, I'm going to click on shell access. It's going to take me to a place where I would then authenticate with my internet identity, which I'll go ahead and do now. Um, I'm going to authorize. I'm going to then do an internet identity authentication. This is really neat stuff. Um, I'm basically authenticating with the same internet identity that I did uh, for the ICPM. And um, I'm going to cancel this just so you can see, because I should have showed that to you. I want to try again. Notice that I'm doing a shared identity in my internet identity. This is a little tricky, uh, but it's basically using the same uh, identity, which means that it would create the same principle as when I access the ICPM at 56D44, right? Notice here, 56D44. So it's a shared internet identity. There's some reading that you can do to figure out what that means, but basically I will be accessing uh, everything with the same principle that was given for the domain of 56D44. Um, so I'll go ahead and do that. I won't cancel it this time. Uh, again, Laptop is in a docking station. That's why I'm not doing a fingerprint and doing a password. Uh, this is now authenticated with II, and it's now creating a proper authentication with my CDN. And once that's happened, I've actually been given cookies, signed cookies, uh, that will allow me ongoing access for a period of time into the replicator network. And now that that's done, I can access the shell by clicking on this. Um, and that's the shell. And now that I'm authenticated, I don't actually need to have any of this open. I can go back to my original uh, replicator host and I can launch the shell access. And what this means is I'm in essence through HTTPS SSH'd or the equivalent uh, into my replicator host, which is an Ubuntu uh, workstation. So you name I say, uh, as you can see here, it is a Ubuntu uh, workstation, um, again, running in a Web2 cloud provider. Now, uh, it has all the same Ubuntu services uh, that I might otherwise want to do. I can you know, install additional ones if I need to. Uh, you can talk to us if you want. Uh, things that are not on there to be pre-packaged. So when you're launching your replicators, uh, it has whatever it is that you need. Uh, but what it does have is the same tool set pre-installed that we installed on my local workstation. So IC Pipeline similarly has all of the Repkin monitor, uh, the deployment as it's happening. Uh, and what we'll also be able to do is access, uh, just like the uh, local host, uh, we'll be able to access the uh, 
Webpack uh, as it gets launched for uh, this front end. And um, what I want to do after that, and just kind of while we'll sit here and watch this run, is I can share this deployment that's running on this remote replicator uh, with my team, uh, with Dan as an example, and say, hey, Dan, why don't you go ahead and take a look at this? And all he has to do is click the link that I, I Slack to him and uh, log in with his internet identity if he hasn't recently, and he's able to view the front end of the project uh, and you know interact with it. Now, if he's a product owner or a QA tester or uh, some of these other roles as teams get bigger, or even if it you know is a small team just like uh, Dan and myself, it's a way to, to in essence, uh, share your code without having to uh, create a, a Zoom meeting and do a shared desktop or um, even uh, change your, your ability to continue to d uh, develop on your workstation if you are, in fact, uh, marching forward. Dan might be out uh, getting a cup of coffee or, or I might be working late and, and um, at different time zones and things like that. And how do you kind of share your projects back and forth? Um, so I see pipelines providing a local tool set. You're able to then take your projects, put them into a shared environment that has a walled garden uh, that only authenticated users are able to get access to. And uh, we'll also be able to deploy to the mainnet, which I'm going to show you next. And we're going to use the uh, Matoko Bootcamp uh, token uh, that we built that Dan mentioned earlier, uh, just to kind of show you how we've used this to um, uh, run that project, uh, at least from a high level. And I'm going to quickly uh, configure after we're done with this part and uh, just show you a, a production deployment uh, so that we can you know, save some time for, for questions and answers. Eventually, we'll have a, a whole host of um, uh, how-to videos and, and use cases. But uh, I have a front-end uh, canister. Uh, this is the uh, Hello Snapshot application um, you know, that we've, we've built to kind of demonstrate uh, some of the snapshot capability. Um, as Dan mentioned, also, we have a uh, IC archive product that we'd like to, to, you know, eventually show folks and, you know, do a demonstration of, um, but uh, there's only so many hours in the day. And the ability to build, build fast, build securely, to be able to have, um, logs and uh, be able to reference uh, those logs, uh, to be able to look at previous deployments in comparison, hey, has something changed, uh, to be able to take snapshots, right? So now I've, I've created um, state data. This is a non-stable uh, state. This is stable state. Uh, if I was to do an upgrade, I would lose the non-stable state unless I programmatically managed it. Uh, IC pipeline snapshots actually um, will take, uh, this is a one, two, three, four snap. Uh, we'll actually take both the, the, uh, the, the, the stable and the unstable memory. And a lot of that has to do with the way the local replica uh, works. And we're just leveraging um, what Definity has done and creating a nice UI and, and tool set to, to, to manage it. Uh, this snapshot, once complete, uh, can be deployed and uh, it will actually have the same state. So if for whatever reason your application, uh, let's say as an example, broke if you put in five uh, pieces of data and uh, you wanted to build and uh, deploy a fix, Right? How do you test that fix? Well, uh, you could basically set up your application to the point right before it breaks, take a snapshot like I'm doing, and then you can redeploy that moment in time over and over again, and then deploy a fix, test the fix. If it doesn't work, revert back to the snapshot. Uh, that, that's, in essence, what the purpose of the tool is. Uh, and the neat thing, too, about the remote uh, snapshots is they will actually 
maintain themselves, removing them off uh, the replicas or off the replicators uh, in the case of the network uh, ones. And um, you can then actually uh, deploy those even as you start and stop uh, the, the, the uh, workstations, the remote workstations. So um, they do take a few minutes because they are copying uh, data back and forth across the, the, the network, and it is the entire state, uh, so it would include um, whatever you might have in there. Uh, so sometimes they could get pretty beefy if you're building um, large canister sets. So that's now complete, uh, similar to before uh, with the Matt's laptop or local replicator. Uh, inside of my remote replicator uh, console, which you can launch either from here or uh, here being the, the deployment dashboard or from uh, the list of replicators. Uh, there's a manage snapshots interface. This is uh, the snapshot we just took. Remember, this is one, two, three, four snap. And um, I can deploy this snapshot. Now, I want to quickly change the state data just to show you. So I'll add a uh, five and a six and a seven. Um, so I've changed the state uh, just to kind of show that the state has changed. And then what we'll do is, is while we're, we're talking a little bit more, I will uh, deploy the uh, or restore uh, the snapshot to this replicator. And um, that'll take a few minutes. And what in essence will happen instead of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I'll refresh this page and it'll be one, two, three, four, which is the state that it was when I took the snapshot. And that'll be inclusive of, again, uh, both the not stable and the stable data. Uh, while that's running, I'm going to go very fast and I'm going to set up um, the MBT boot camp, that Motoko boot camp uh, project. So I'm going to kill this. I see pipeline. Projects, sorry, list. Okay, and we're going to grab this guy and we're going to do IC pipe line projects remove that guy. It's going to stop and start the service. Uh, that's fine. And then we're going to add two projects. Uh, one is the uh, token, right? So that is in dev bootcamp ICRC1. And then we're going to add the MBT uh, folder. All right, so now I have two projects on my local replicator deployment package, local ICRC, uh, local MBT, all right? Now, both of those are uh, uh, attached, and because I stopped and started, or because it stopped and started the service, it wiped out uh, the configuration of the deployment, and we're going to kick off a new deployment on my local uh, replicator and uh, Matt's laptop configuration. Create a job. Can sit there and watch the job. Notice there's a repository one and two, deploy one and two. Uh, it's going to use the starter state that we configured earlier. Now, interestingly, the, the project that we're working with um, doesn't require internet identity, or at least this you know version of it. And so, um, but that doesn't matter. We have the starter state already configured, and the fact that it's going to deploy every time it doesn't hurt anything. And uh, we'll go ahead and let that run. While that's running, we'll take a look at our snapshots, right? Um, the snapshot that was the one, two, three, four snapshot, that's now completed. And the hello snapshot, which was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I want to refresh this bad boy. And it's now one, two, three, four, because I've reconstituted the deployment that I took the snapshot of. Uh, or restored the snapshot. Hopefully that makes sense and hopefully you guys understand uh, like how 
neat that is and clicky clicky uh, i know once you get your heads wrapped around it uh it's going to be exciting because it was very exciting to us once we realized that uh, we could actually do it um okay so how we're we doing on our uh MBT local deployment. Looks like it's got the uh, ICRC canister started um, and it's starting the MBT uh, deployment. Uh, again, it's going to be a little complicated because I need to get canister IDs uh, from those deployments before I can actually set up and configure the deployment properly. Now we're going to grab uh, the back end canister because uh, we're going to need that and we're going to go into our VS code. Um, I have a notes uh, thing here where you need to set the minter uh, when you launch the token canister and uh, oops, go ahead and do that and I'm going to copy this basically a shell script into uh, my project that got automatically created for the ICRC and as we did before, I'm just going to paste this sucker in here. And uh, while we're here, I actually have the uh, stage deployment, which will be the end of our demo, because uh, I don't want to mess with the live token because you guys are, are using it. And um, this has a stage uh, minter, uh, which uh, we created, and we'll, we'll deploy that at the very end and uh, end the demo. Now, um, in order to be able to do a stage deployment, I needed to find a stage branch. Uh, this picked up the GitHub branch from my uh, addition doing IC pipeline projects add uh, from the actual uh, Git configuration. So we'll go ahead and save that. And then uh, on the MBT profile, uh, we're going to uncomment out the stage deployment as well and put in a stage, uh, oops, that's the developer token, that's not right, uh, stage branch, right, which again, uh, we're going to do a stage deployment and build a stage package, uh, kind of a, a quick uh, end to the demo, but save that. And now that that's all set up, we're going to redo the deployment. Uh, we actually need to grab, before I forget, this is the token canister uh, for my local deployment. I need to add that because uh, it's going to be different since we've done all these deployments than what's in my main mo for my uh, minter. Uh, so my local canister ID is now changed to that. And we'll save all this stuff. Um, and we'll go ahead and kick off a new deployment with these configurations on my local replicator. And what we should end up with is a functioning minter with a functioning ICRC canister all running locally on my laptop, all managed and deployed by IC Pipeline, uh, which is a, a mouthful, but is very neat. Now, this is going to again take a minute, and uh, while that's happening, I'm going to build a stage deployment package using my two projects, the token and um, Minter. So, a package. Uh, create new deployment package, uh, type stage, we're going to call this MBT stage, and uh, a whole other conversation is being able to build out identities and use different identities to manage different deployments. Uh, those different identities could have different wallets with different amounts of uh, cycles. Um, there's some security implications and some other things as you're getting into larger teams that, you know, are, are hearty conversations. Uh, excited to have those conversations with you. All right, so first we're going to, oops, uh, we only have the local MBT. I might have missed a step. Uh, local I, C. Oh, I didn't save that. That should be, oh, I put it in the developer token. Oops. 
save that. If it doesn't have a uh, branch for stage or production, it won't allow you to build a uh, deployment package. That's what we just saw. So do this again, MBT stage. And that's all good. Add a project profile. Oops, that's the replicator. It needs to be. Stop it. Stage. And then I now have all these. I can do my ICRC. It's going to do this deployment. Uh, it's going to use a predefined uh, canister ID that I, you know, had already deployed this. Uh, like I said. And that should be all good to go. I'm going to add another project profile. So now this is a deployment package that's going to deploy two project profiles, which is really neat. And these are two separate uh, GitHub endpoints, two separate folders, and they will both be launched to the mainnet uh, simultaneously, the same way they are both being launched to my local uh, replica uh, simultaneously. Save that. Now that I have this stage uh, deployment package, uh, if I go into my pipeline, you'll see that I now have a stage level deployment package uh, or stage level uh, deployment that I can do. And this is an interface we haven't seen yet, but replicators would be anything from development to QA, uh, UAT, uh, whatever you might want to label them as, but this is where you do all of your off-chain development and um, is much more secure until you're ready to deploy to the mainnet. Uh, you then might do a mainnet deployment on some stage canisters and then eventually your production canisters, right? So uh, let's take a look at our local deployment and see how that went, all right? So we have a success and we have our ICRC. We have um, basically a candid interface that we can look at. Uh, we can see that there is uh, a eight decimals here's my minting account uh, rdm x6 that should hopefully be this guy our back end mbt canister rdm x6 cool uh, you can see the name is you know the matoko boot camp token all right so we're ready to rock total supply is zero so now let's take a look at the front end all right so we have the front end of the mbt faucet you guys have all seen this before uh, this is how we actually built the MBT canister and we're working on it and sharing it by putting it on a uh, remote replicator for, for us to work off of. And now that that's actually, you know, configured and we've done, you know, the, the, the stage deployment package, uh, which we just set up here, uh, I can go ahead into my pipeline, but uh, the stage environment uh, is all set up. Uh, there are canister ID .json files in both of these that will pick up uh, canister definitions. I could just as easily go into my deployment packages and uh, go into the uh, project profiles and I can add canisters ahead of time, uh, put in the canister ID, the type of canister, and it will basically build those canisters into a canister IDs .json file. So if you already have uh, production and, and uh, mainnet canisters, you can add them as profiles um, so that uh, uh, they will be in your IC pipeline beforehand, or if the canister IDs .json file lives in your folder uh, the way that the ones we're about to do, um, it will pull those in and, and build um, the profiles accordingly. So I want to go ahead and do that, and we'll kick off a stage deployment. Stage and production deployments can uh, be executed as jobs by any type of replicator, uh, whether it be a remote replicator or a local uh, host replicator, uh, local host replicators, we use whatever identities um, or whatever identity you have currently active uh, and or will inject the identity based on uh, the package uh, definition. Uh, at the moment, we haven't built any identities. That's a whole nother conversation, but uh, we have the ability to do so. And uh, with that said, I'll go into pipeline. I'll go into stage. 
I see my stage MBT package and I'm going to go ahead and use Matt's laptop as a replicator and I'm going to deploy my package from my pipeline using my local replicator. And just like any other deployment, um, I can watch it and uh, it has some you know, visual designations just to make sure you know uh, that it's an on-chain deployment and that um, I should also point out that snapshots and some of the things that I showed on uh, replicators, um, whether remote or, or local replicators, that's not something that's available on-chain uh, or for on-chain deployments. Uh, we are building a, uh, a sibling uh, platform called IC Archive, uh, which will allow you to uh, add code to your uh, canisters and would then be able to interact with uh, this service uh, set of canisters that we're building that would basically allow you to push and pull uh, data set uh, data sets um, tag them and programmatically manage uh, what would in essence be uh, off canister uh, backups and, and snapshots including being able to sling those to uh, web 2 uh, type um, storage facilities and uh, with that uh, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, wait for this deployment to finish. Deployment that we have currently going on uh, has been successful. Uh, it's now on chain and we have again our candid interface uh, for the uh, token canister and we have our front end and back end interfaces um, for our minter. Right? These are the, the methods that are made available and uh, the front end, which this is actually an on-chain uh, deployment. So hopefully the, very fast. I totally understand if this was confusing and too much information coming, um, but there is a lot that we've been working on and it's eminent uh, to being able to put this into production uh, for folks like you to uh, use and uh, in particular, help us make better. Uh, and with that, thank you very much. And I really appreciate the time and the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Matoko Bootcamp. Uh, thank you, um, everybody that's participated. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Have a great night. All right, that was awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. All right, so. Yeah, thanks for letting us. No problem, no problem. Well, let me see. I uh, The chat seems like there's been a lot going on. And Dan, I see you've added a lot in there. Yeah, it's mostly just me. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, let's see. Does anyone want to raise their hand and, uh, and or enter the Q&A? Ask questions about the uh, awesome tool we just saw. Everybody while we're it? while we're waiting, um, sure. Um, I, I I would just mention, uh, it it's cool that that um, Matt went under the covers and and talked a lot about you know how things are actually working. I think that's cool especially here in Matoko boot camp where folks do actually know what's going on under the covers uh but by the same token we don't want you to get the like this is here to make life simple you know as I entered in the um uh chat you know like for instance you know deployment packages those are extremely flexible and robust you can do anything you need to do I mean you know, as projects grow, you know, the build steps become more complex, it becomes more of a, a proprietary, almost business intelligence that, that becomes part of the project itself. Deployment packages are how you capture all that. It, 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 it runs the same way every time just by clicking the deploy button, you know. So, but by the same token, if you have a straight up build where it's just basically NPM install DFX deploy, Mm -hmm. you really don't even need to look at your de deployment package that that happens automatically. So, you know, s simplicity really is, is the key here that we wouldn't want to get lost in, um, in this. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's got, it can do a lot of things, but in the data and like the actual day-to-day -day usage, it looks great. I mean, I think uh, one of the things everybody relates to 
on this chat is the difficulty with like things that should be simple, like integrating internet identity or ledger in local development. So like when you started off and you showed that, um, I think there's a comment by somebody who's like, why didn't we just have this in the first place? <laughs> like, and I said, well, I mean, it's still, you could learn, like, like if you didn't, you need to appreciate it, right? If you don't, what it's like not having that versus having it. Um, I mean, I was blown away almost immediately, like when I, when I saw that. So, um, I mean, how do you, in fact, I'll take that, this question. So like, how did you pull that off basically? Like, I don't know. Yeah, well, it, it's, you know, in essence, the WASM that's available, uh, well, it first started when we first did it was, you know, downloading the source code and, you know, in essence, baking in a, uh, a clone git update and uh, a deployment of the internet identity. Uh, mm -hmm. and once you figure out how to do it yourself, you can script it. It's, it's a lot of this stuff is, is, as Dan was saying, trying to make things simpler, right? So the launch the internet identity for the first time for us was a, was a journey through the woods, uh, you know, without a, a machete, right? It, it, it's a it, or journey through the jungle without a machete. It, it was a, um, a fact finding mission. It was anything that you want to say. And once that is done, uh, you then know, right? It's interesting to know how to, you know, get uh, Rust installed. And it's interesting to, to know how to um, use cargo and, you know, do a, a um, Rust deployment, which is, is what Internet Identity is built in. After I've taken time to learn Matoko, this is to you all, you Matoko mm -hmm. boot campers. Uh, but being able to use Internet Identity programmatically so that I can build it into my application, uh, that's going to be more interesting to 99% of the people. And I want to be able to deploy an app on the main net and I want to be able to use internet identity or I want to be able to use NFID or I want to mm -hmm. be able to use um, whatever the case may be. I don't want to have to deploy to test it. I want to be able to test it locally, build locally. And um, it was really that that kind of uh, sparked uh, our journey, uh, if you will. And uh, everything has been about trying to make what might have been a large learning curve or uh, overhead to get us back to where we're actually building our app, we figured that's the tooling that needs to be built. And yeah. um, we'll, we'll, that, that's we'll, kind of where we are. That I, I would just add, we, we started doing this on day one. We had a long conversation and we have held true to it that um, while we want to make things easy, at the same time, we do not want to wallpaper over stuff and we do not want to like be like spooning people uh, proprietary Kool-Aid. Mm. So, and we've held true to that, you know, like it's all there and it is straight up. I see like there, are, you, this does not require any changes, moves, or even copies of your code. What comes out the other end in theory is exactly what you would have had without IC pipeline, yeah. only a hell of a lot easier. Well, and it's a great way to stick to kind of like the Web3 ethos, um, you know, yeah. kind of writing some more modern tools while also being true to that. Um, yeah, no, that's really cool. And like, so once you get to this point um, where this is all going to be live very soon, um, what's kind of looking like the next steps for you at that point? Like, like where are you going to take IC Pipeline and kind of see it um, doing in, in like the next phase, I guess? The uh, the IC archive application, okay. uh, which is in essence a, a backup and, and recovery uh, solution, where uh, being able to take state data and move it off of your canister onto another canister, uh, but to be able to do that on demand, uh, potentially. Uh, on a nightly basis, if you're doing nightly backups, as it were, being able to take those moments in time and maybe start to roll those off to, uh, as I mentioned in the, in the video, Web2 storage. Um, and then one of the more interesting things that that can bring from a development perspective is how do you bring your production state data into a testing environment, right? Mm -hmm. So if I, if I actually have a application 
uh, that's uh, live and on the main net and it's generating user data and things of that nature. There is no easy way as of yet to get that information as it stands today into a development space. Uh, so let's say there's a bug um, or a feature that you're trying to, to you know, make work in production, but the code isn't the problem. There's something in the data plus the code that's making this anomaly happen, you know, where you yeah. can't re recreate it without the local data. So how do you bring that data all the way around through? We, we, we believe the IC archive uh, platform uh, has a lot of potential and that the IC pipeline uh, is really just an orchestration layer that IC archive and others from the community, you know, there, there's uh, Byron's CanDB, um, Demergence Labs has has the, the uh, uh, graph uh, database that they're, they're building. Um, you know, there's, there's NFID and other, you know, uh, projects that could all be as easily implemented into IC pipelines development tree as uh, we've demonstrated with the internet identity. So um, how do you glue together all of these, uh, I don't know, the decentralized cloud products, right? The, the, yeah. How do you build a decentralized cloud service that to Dan's point from a minute ago, doesn't wallpaper over the details, like how do you build the tools that real developers building real things need uh, to do it at scale? Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Oh, you're on mute, Dan. Oh, my bad. Um, one other thing I just wanted to throw in about IC Archive, to, uh, I think a very significant piece of that is, uh, I mean, not just like the common sense, like rainy day insurance of, you know, I have backups but also the accessibility of your canister state data. I mean, you know, let's face it, at least at the moment in time, you know, all your tooling for analytics, BI dashboards, you know, ML, you know, modeling, test and train splits, all of that stuff, you know, our programming, stuff like that, that all is still lives in web too. So the idea of the three clicks and my canister state data is a JSON object in an S3 bucket, um, all of a sudden, you know, my data are the hands-on working assets that they should be, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, oh, that's incredible. And I think, uh, yeah, so I know it's uh, on, on the chat, it's, it's expected to be a little bit slow because it's uh, a time zone um, for the slots because uh, <laughs> and I wanted to thank y'all again because uh, it was like 4 a.m. and 3.30 a.m. and your time zones respectively. So I really, really appreciate it making the sacrifice um to to attend and and uh it's all it's all global man yeah it's all global it's 24 7 and can't stop not stopping um but hey it, it, we still have some on here live so um come on let's ask a question if not I'll, I'll be trying to think of questions that others will be be asking themselves when they see the recording in a few hours i'm trying to think of stuff too oh yeah Matthew was using the term a lot, obviously, replicator. That's simply, you know, you know, hey, we're engineers, not marketing people. So we came up with the term replicator. <laughs> that the replicator basically refers to anything that's off chain. As you heard, Matthew was talking about his local replicator versus mm -hmm. a dedicated remote host replicator. You can also containerize them. You can run replicators as dockers if you want. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, it's basically that's just a catch all term for any off chain replica environment before you seamlessly transition to on chain deployments. And we use standard, you know, uh, CI CD rubric for that, you know, dev to QA to stage to prod. Uh, but just that's all completely optional. You know, as I mentioned yeah. in the chat, if you just want to do a local build and then deploy straight to prod from there, nothing will stand in your way. Like you don't, you're not locked into like some kind of, you know, big giant template thing. It, it's, it, it's all just Lego blocks. You snap them together however you want. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And maybe a little bit about like, how would the team dynamic work? Like say you were developing an application with like three people, um, how how does that kind of look uh, when you when you're when you kind of collaboratively building a DAP? Because um, we're hoping some of these students will form their own teams and kind of start doing that kind of thing. Well, the <clears throat> excuse me. Well, the the 
if you're both developers, let's say you're a two team person, um, you might be working on different pieces uh, on your local environment and you might use uh, the remote host uh, replicator as a place to merge uh, your, your, your work and then basically do end to end tests uh, on that merged work. But as Dan said, you could just as easily do that on your, on your local um, and that being able to share the project profiles between uh, mm -hmm. users, which, you know, would, would, would basically mean that if I did a deployment and then you ran the same profile on your uh, workstation, you should end up with identical results as long mm -hmm. as, uh, you know, you're using the same GitHub branches and, and, and so on. Um, and that's the place that we want to get to, right? To where uh, there's a, a word repeatability that it, that is, you know, inherent in uh, solid uh, DevOps and and um, the ability to uh, consistently do the same thing over and over again. Uh, there are folks that are are mature and and are building and using you know existing tools. Uh, we're not looking to to surplant those uh in fact we want to be um the the bespoke uh internet computer plug-in for those in the long run right so if you're using the GitLabs and the the jenkins and and you know other such tools they they still need uh i don't know what what would you call it? access to an internet computer tooling system yeah. and uh that that's kind of the bridge that that we're we're working towards but it also becomes interesting if the second person is not a developer, right? Mm. And all of a sudden you might have a product person and a developer and that product person, you know, in order to even view any of this stuff, they have choice number one, which is a Zoom meeting and choice number two, which is, you know, downloading, installing DFX and basically trying to figure out how to become a developer. Uh, by using the remote host replicator, you can push all of that code, and then that uh, developer's uh, partner, the, the the product owner or or marketer, they just get a link, and um, they're just using the front end of the D app as if they were a user, which is all you want them to be thinking about, anyways. And you don't want to be putting that on the main net because the main net is the blockchain and the main net is open to everybody. And if yeah. you have problems, issues, security, exposure, whatever the case may be, um, you're literally putting all of that out there before you even know it exists. So yeah. it's a walled garden bespoke to your project that is networkly accessible from anywhere um, securely. Awesome. Yeah. As much as, as as much as we we all know the like the 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 virtues of the blockchain, in a sense, the immutable public ledger is not an inherently friendly space for you know privacy and walled gardens. You know, I don't think immutable and public are two words that spring to mind when most people think about you know the early stages of the development process. Yeah, and that definitely. And you know, more to the point of uh, trying to make. Um... Kind of, kind of like include everyone on this. We have many different audiences, and I think that it's pretty clear for any experienced dev, especially one who's used tooling before, like what the value add is here. But uh, one thing we, um, we want to keep in mind, like I said, we're getting close to the end of the time that we have. So I want to give you a chance. What? How would you explain the value add? to a, someone who just learned how to use GitHub like this week, this, like like they learned how to use GitHub to get into the bootcamp. I mean, we have a few of these, you know, where they're just so new to coding. They Not only have they not used a, um, a you know, tooling like this before, um, they're just made their first deployments within the past week. So like, I, I know that sometimes when we prepare lectures and stuff, like I, I me especially, like I feel like I don't want to be talking down or anything else like that, but I think it'd be useful to kind of hear in your own words, like as simply as possible, um, like like how you would describe that to that person if you if you're meeting them right now. Well, I appreciate you ask, asking that question. I'm sure Matthew will expand on my answer, but one thing I want to make sure doesn't get lost is we focused on exactly what uh, 
you just said, Isaac, um, mm -hmm. the idea that someone can just walk in the door, they're blockchain curious, they're kicking the tires on the IC, and they're saying, hey, what's up with this? Um, we, we, we have created a essentially cut and paste, hit paste it, hit go, and you're up and running. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have a magic wand as far as the reading that everybody has to do. I mean, everybody should do the reading and our documentation con yeah. continues to emphasize that. Um, but if we look at, you know, say, say staged deployments, you know, you, you talked about mm -hmm. uh, Git. Um, we think the, the the framework interacts beautifully with Git. You know, obviously any node, any, any endpoint uh, can interact with Git. Uh, our remote host replicators, you know, it, it's just a Linux machine that, you know, you can log into, you know, sudo su, and you're in full control of that machine. So um, as far as going back to if you're just starting to get some dirt under your fingernails, as far as with Git and so forth, um, I would say that the what I would call the vanilla component of this uh, would be your friend there. I mean, if you just mm -hmm. know a few basic Git commands, you know, you can, as Matt showed, you can do it right in your browser, you know, get to the command line in any one of these nodes and just do the basic meat and potatoes stuff uh, mm -hmm. as you learn it. And the beauty part is, you know, if you break something on one of these replicas, mm -hmm. you just you just flush it and start start over. Yeah. Anything to add there, Matt? Matthew? Uh, basically, not much. It, it's it's uh, how do you get started? Um, you get started with examples. Uh, you get started with uh, cookbooks. Um, you know the the internet computer uh, on the Definity website or the internet computer website now. Um, as far as like the getting started steps, it says download this and let's get an app launched. Uh, so yeah. that you can see it and uh the sooner you get that adrenaline rush of actually having accomplished something uh that's what gets you hooked so our goal is to make it so that you can be up and running with ic pipeline in the shortest amount of time and see something running like yeah. the hello world that you you you, you have it and um, if we can reduce friction that we know people might get through uh, or get get stuck in uh, the way that some folks might do with even just doing the the DFX install, um, you know, that's part of like that initial script. Ideally, it's going to check and maybe install node, maybe install NPM, maybe install SDK, all with just the one thing. Yeah. Uh, how do how do we make it easy for them? Is actually a question that. Uh, we want to know the answer to, right? Because uh, we, we, it's been a long time since uh, I first learned how to use Git. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> so the, the, the aspect of how, how to put ourselves in that position, uh, one yeah. thing before we end here, uh, we are going to be sending around a, a form uh, that hopefully we can get some folks to participate in a, a beta testing uh thing that we want to do uh, not this week but next week and um we're hoping that folks from the matoko boot camp uh, are willing to to join yeah and, uh, as i mentioned in the video uh, our, our hope is to kind of make this somewhat uh organized enough so that the participants uh, we're going to give uh some free uh services uh, so those pips so that you can use these replicators, uh, we'll, we'll be giving a whole bunch of those away to those that help us uh, test and, and give us feedback. Because uh, we would like to launch this soon, but uh, we also really would love to, to collect as much uh, friction points beforehand. Yeah. By having done the, the Minter this last week, we actually have a list that, that came out of our own uh, so-called dog food testing. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah, we're, we're sure that there's more if we can get some more folks in front of it uh, in a safe space. Exactly. And well, I just kind of want to, you said, I'm, I'm coming from the marketing background. So let me paraphrase what you all just said um, in, in words that hopefully will resonate. Um, 
if I, if I was talking to someone brand new to coding who's watching this, I would say look through the Ask Questions channel on Discord and look at all the different questions, all the different friction points that people hit. This tool is essentially meant to address like what, like 80% of them. So they're not a, an issue getting started. A lot of the things that you probably ran into that you had problems with, like trying to get um, in an identity working in local environment, a lot of this stuff is being addressed by this tool. So it makes your life easier to get started. And then, and then these other features that maybe you haven't heard of before, there's a lot, a lot of words you're going to have to look up and Google after this. Those are all um, tools that's, uh, that is part of your dev career you're going to need to get familiar with anyways. And you might as well. So like how to properly use the staging server and environment before you, you host the production DAP. A lot of this stuff is really you know critical skill thinking. So I would encourage you to also... Um, looking to becoming an early adopter and tester of this tool um, at any skill level. And uh, thank you so much, Matthew and Dan. I really appreciate your time. And let's uh, let's get coding Matoko and get these uh, core projects in and wrapping this thing up strong. Here, here. Thanks, thank Isaac. you again very much, Isaac. And good luck to everybody. Yeah, good luck. All right. See you around.